Thank you very much, Will, for this generous introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, well, I would like to start with a short uh, Florovsky uh, anecdote. Uh, uh, and this is, uh, this is an image of Florovsky uh, at the uh, uh, second assembly of the World Council of Churches that happened to be happening just nearby, Evanston. Uh, and so Florovsky at one of the um, uh, ecumenical meetings uh, was approached by the Bishop of the Patriarchate of Moscow uh, and was asked, uh, Father George, uh, in your heart of hearts, don't you regret uh, that you are presently not serving in the church in which you were baptized. Now one has to explain that Florovsky was baptized in Odessa uh, and uh, uh, he was serving at the time uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this particular conversation in the, uh, in the ecumenical patriarchate. To which Florovsky replied, I didn't realize that I was baptized in the Russian church or that such a church in fact existed. For me, there is only the Orthodox church. As you can imagine, the bishop was not amused. However, Florovsky was certainly right. In the rite of baptism, the rite itself says nothing about our initiation into a Russian or a Greek church. The Nicene Creed also proclaims a church that is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic, and not the church that is divided, nationalistic, isolated, and subservient to the state. Father George was a prominent and trusted voice in the ecumenical movement, and hence, as you can see, he gets the uh, triune mic. Uh, I love those. Uh, uh, those are really very difficult to get uh, nowadays. Because he staunchly defended the universal and conciliar character of the Orthodox Church and consistently criticized the divisions within the church for nationalistic and political reasons. Unfortunately, these divisions persist in the life of our church, contribute to our alienation, and prevent us from recovering the fullness of synodality. In his keynote address at IOTA's inaugural conference, which uh, Dr. Will Cohen mentioned, uh, Metropolitan Callistos Ware observed, and I quote, we Orthodox are accustomed to speak of ourselves as a conciliar church, as the church of the seven holy councils. But we have to confess with humility and realism that while we affirm synodality in theory, all too often we have neglected it in practice. As, a, as an example of such a neglect, Metropolitan Callistos pointed out that it took our church leadership nearly a century to organize the Council of Crete. This council held great promise to bring together the representatives of all self-governing churches, uh, but when the council finally met, it was overshadowed by the absence of the four local churches, the patriarchates of Antioch, Bulgaria, Georgia, and Moscow, who decided to stay home. In this manner, the Council of Creed made manifest our deeply wounded synodality. In 2018, the situation deteriorated when the Patriarchate of Moscow protested the decision of the Ecumenical Patriarchate concerning the church in Ukraine by unilaterally breaking communion with Constantinople. And uh, if the situation develops in the way it's been developing, uh, the Patriarchate of Moscow will have a relatively short diptychs to pronounce during liturgy. This might ha uh, may make for much shorter litanies, unfortunately. At present, Global orthodoxy has not produced uncontested and reliable mechanisms for resolving international disputes and healing divisions. Specifically, there are no reliable mechanisms for assembling pan-orthodox councils, adjudicating jurisdictional disputes, and granting autocephaly. If no such mechanisms are developed, if these wounds are allowed to fester, then we will remain a conciliar church only in theory. We will continue boasting about gl our glorious conciliar past while remaining profoundly divided at present. And so in this talk, I will develop what I call conciliar ecclesiology by focusing on three main issues. First, I will reflect on the conciliar nature of the church by discussing four dimensions or levels of synodality, local, regional, universal, and eschatological. Second, I will address the underlying causes of our present divisions at the universal level. And finally, 
I will propose a new mechanism for addressing our present dysfunctions. More specifically, I will argue for the expansion of lay responsibilities in the conciliar process. So let me be clear from the very beginning that I'm using the English words synod and council as synonyms referring to the same reality of the Christian assembly. The Greek term synodos literally means walking together, and the Latin term concilium refers to a group of people who have been called together to pursue a common task. The church, ecclesia, is conciliar or synodal in nature because it is an assembly of the followers of Jesus who have been summoned or called out to fulfill a divine purpose. According to Nicholas Afanasyev, and I quote, at the moment of its establishment, the church contained within itself a potential council. The heart of the church's life is the assembly of the faithful for the sake of celebrating the Eucharist. The Eucharistic assembly goes back to the gathering of the disciples around Jesus at the Last Supper. As in the Last Supper, in the Eucharist, Christ offers his body and blood to the faithful. Through the Eucharist, the faithful jointly participate in the life of God. Eucharistic communion is the primary act of the church in a conciliar manner. This conciliar act has two dimensions, local and eschatological. The Eucharistic assembly is a local council which includes the presider, the concelebrating clergy, and the laity praying together. In the ancient church practice, a general term that describes regular worship services, such as Vespers, Matins, Hours, and the Divine Liturgy, was synaxis, which literally means a process of acting together. The primate of the local liturgical assembly is the presiding priest or bishop who acts together with the concelebrating clergy and the people. Most liturgical prayers are recited on behalf of the whole congregation, and many of them require the familiar responses from the congregation, such as, Lord have mercy, or grant us, O Lord, or amen, and so on. The liturgical amen is especially important because it indicates the congregation's assent to the words spoken by the presider and demonstrates the conciliar nature of such a gathering. Since all worship services are conciliar events, it is fitting to open our parish councils and annual parish meetings at the end of such services in order to indicate that worship and decision-making are a part of one unbroken conciliar process at the local level. In other words, parish councils, uh, as difficult as it might be to imagine, are not simply business secular events. They really are a part of one conciliar process. The Eucharistic Assembly is a local conciliar event and much more. Eschatologically, the Eucharist is a sacrament of entry into the kingdom of God. The sacrament of communion establishes not only the visible bonds with our fellow parishioners, but also the invisible bonds with all members of the mystical body of Christ. The Eucharist grants access to the greatest universal council ever assembled, the communion of the saints. As you can see in the drum, essentially, of this, of this magnificent cupola, you have the saints uh, uh, around the perimeter and then subsequently joined by the angels celebrating the divine Eucharist in heaven. In this life, our participation in this communion is proleptic and therefore incomplete. In the Eucharist, we are given a foretaste of the messianic banquet and of the reality of Christ's kingdom. Indeed, we're introduced to these realities by the words and actions of the divine liturgy. We are invited into the communion of the saints by the images of the saints flanking the image of Christ. The iconostasis is an image of the everlasting council at which the saints intercede before the throne of God and pray for the healing of the brokenness of our world. In addition to local and eschatological dimensions, synodality has two other dimensions in the church, regional and universal. The regional dimension uh, of synodality has several expressions. One expression of regional synodality is the diocesan assembly, which brings together the representatives of local Orthodox communities. These representatives may include priests, deacons, monastics, and lay leaders. The primate of the diocesan assembly is the bishop. 
Another expression of regional synodality is the ordination of a new bishop, which is conferred in the presence of three or more bishops and in the midst of the Eucharistic assembly of the clergy and lay people. Yet another expression of regional conciliarity is the Holy Synod of Bishops of a self-governing church. Historically, the voting members of the Holy Synod are exclusively senior bishops who have received a special appointment. Let us note that the Holy Synod of Bishops is the first instance of a conciliar gathering that limits decision-making to bishops only. All previously discussed conciliar gatherings included other members of the body of Christ. In addition, each self-governing church has the ability to summon its own councils and conferences. In our context, for example, we have, of course, the practice of all American councils of the Orthodox Church in America or the national conferences uh, of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. Finally, also in our context, we have the assembly of canonical Orthodox bishops of the United States of America. Due to its makeup, this assembly includes the elements of regional synodality because its members serve in one region, namely the United States, as well as the elements of universal synodality because some of its members serve on the holy synods of their mother churches, which have their jurisdictions in other countries. And so all local and most regional expressions of synodality include lesser clergy, monastics, and lay leaders. The only conciliar gatherings at which only bishops make decisions and vote at the holy synods and the, are, the, are the holy synods and the episcopal assemblies. Now, there is certainly a place for exclusively episcopal synods in our polity, as many practical and disciplinary decisions concerning the life of a self-governing church should remain the prerogative of the bishops. So I do not wish to belittle the importance of exclusively episcopal conciliar bodies. It would be a mistake, however, to use exclusively Episcopal assemblies as the primary paradigm of conciliarity. So when we think of the ecumenical councils, very often specifically the image of the bishops uh, uh, assembled for a council uh, comes to mind. Well, in fact, these are exceptions rather than the rules in the conciliar process. As a rule, the conciliar process includes other members of the body of Christ. The assemblies that consist of the bishop only are an exception rather than the rule. After all, according to our conciliar theory, all hierarchical decisions, uh, hierarchical decision making is subject to the process of reception by the whole church. And so things are no different when we move to the final universal level. At the universal level, orthodox synodality has been historically expressed by a pan-orthodox council which includes the representatives of all self-governing Orthodox churches. When we think of ourselves as a conciliar church, the image of the ecumenical councils comes to mind. Historically, these councils were dominated by the bishops, although lesser clergy and monastics were often present as aides to the bishops. To mention a famous example, Athanasius uh, the Great, who was still a deacon, was present at the Council of Nicaea as an assistant to Bishop Alexander of Alexandria. The Council of Chalcedon was provoked by the teaching of the monk Eutychus, supported by Archbishop Dioscorus of Alexandria. Maximus the Confessor and John of Damascus were monastics rather than bishops, yet their theological thought influenced the input, excuse me, influenced the outcome of the Sixth and the Seventh Ecumenical Councils to far greater extent than the input of any bishop involved in those conciliar deliberations. More importantly, as I already mentioned, each council in the Orthodox tradition undergoes a process of reception by the whole church, which includes lesser clergy, monastics, and laity. So let me turn now to the main causes of our present divisions. Why are we experiencing a breakdown of synodality at the universal level? Now, one explanation is that we have inherited a complex political and historical reality of a deeply divided world. The crumbling of the Ottoman Empire and the Soviet Union has led to the emergence of the nation states, which have to negotiate a balance between the national interests and international concerns. In Central and Eastern Europe, many churches are struggling to come to grips with their country's colonial and totalitarian past. A move from state control to freedom has proven to be very difficult to navigate for many church leaders. 
the symbiotic relationship with the governments of nation states provides so many short-term benefits, like the building of the new churches and the expansion of the church's influence in society, that many hierarchs ignore the potentially damaging long-term consequences of such a close relationship. When the church leadership's prim primary accountability is to the strategic interests of a nation state, anything that threatens that relationship becomes a problem. Since international orthodox cooperation requires global thinking and acting, such cooperation is perceived as a potential threat to national interests. Now, superimposed upon this matrix of tensions between national and global interests is the rivalry between Moscow and Constantinople. This unfortunate struggle for dominance is then joined by the churches in the Hellenic and the Slavic spheres of interest, influence, with only a few self-governing churches attempting to maintain some neutrality. And the most promising example of such neutrality is the Romanian Orthodox Church, which, however, also sometimes leans towards Moscow. The continuing discord between Moscow and Constantinople, exacerbated by the attempts to find a solution to the Ukrainian issue, is a symptom of a more general problem. Now, this general problem has to do with the competing understandings of universal primacy, what one might call a crisis of universal primacy in the Orthodox Church. Not everything about primatial authority is contested, of course. In fact, there are certain non-negotiables. For example, it is universally accepted that the highest authority belongs to Christ, who is the head of the church. All other forms of authority are derivative and grounded in Christ's authority. There is also a broad agreement that we are a conciliar church, which means that we arrive at most important decisions as statements of faith by conciliar process. Historically, when issues of global importance were concerned, the most authoritative vehicle of decision-making, as I have already mentioned, has been an ecumenical council. Generally speaking, a council is recognized as ecumenical only after a process of reception by a church as a whole. And so the authority of the ecumenical councils, while it derives from the lordship of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, is supreme in the sense that no Orthodox Church leader is above such a council. This is expressed in a popular sentiment that unlike the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church does not and should not have a pope. In other words, no head of any self-governing Orthodox Church, a patriarch or an archbishop, may enjoy the primacy of universal jurisdiction and consequently may not interfere in the internal matters of other self-governing churches. Now, the experience of the Council of Crete has demonstrated that this widely accepted understanding of primatial authority, that is to say the Council itself is supreme and we don't need the Pope, is insufficient. On Crete, we discovered that the conciliar process is likely to break down in the absence of the juridical and potentially coercive authority of either the Pope or the Emperor. It is true that the popes have often abused their powers by acting in an autocratic manner. Indeed, the history of papacy should serve as a cautionary uh, tale. However, it would be a mistake to view papal authority exclusively as antithetical to the authority of the council. We should recall that after the great schism of 1054, the overwhelming majority of the general councils in the West were summoned by the popes. In other words, the conciliar process to an extent succeeded in the West precisely because of the existence of the institution of papacy. Now, the practice of the first millennium was different. As a rule, important uh, councils were typically called and financed by the Byzantine emperors. Famously, the Council of Nicaea in 325 was summoned by the Emperor Constantine, who was at the time an unbaptized layman. According to Eusebius, Constantine called himself, and I quote, a bishop of those outside of the church, which was theologically tenuous, to say the least, but indicated that the emperor had a significant function in the life of the church. The Council of Chalcedon was summoned by the emperor Martian at the instigation of his wife and co-ruler, the emperor's Pulcheria. The seventh ecumenical council was summoned by the empress Irene, who opposed the iconoclasts and plays a major political role in defending the veneration of icons. 
So the imperial involvement in the, in, in the councils is a form of lay leadership that awaits a fuller theoretical exposition. The Byzantine doctrine of, of symphonia of the church and state uh, 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 begins to address this issue, but doesn't sufficiently account for the imperial participation in the conciliar process. Now, obviously, this involvement was not without its problems, one of which was the use of the coercive power of the state to persecute, exile, and sometimes even mutilate and execute those who dissented from the conciliar decisions. Uh, the example of Maximus the Confessor comes to mind. Let me be very clear that I'm not advocating a return to a romanticized Byzanti uh, Byzantium with a benevolent emperor or empress to summon pan-Orthodox councils. This would be historically misguided and politically utopian. Now, the most powerful living politician in the Orthodox world, who has recently exploited the image of the pious Orthodox autocrat to his advantage is the Russian President Vladimir Putin. And so here, Putin is shown as visiting Mount Athos and as you can see, sitting in what was described as the throne of the bishops and the Byzantine emperors. Unfortunately, the autocrats are usually not as pious as they look on the camera. The Russian president's military incursions in Georgia and Ukraine have led to the loss of over 15,000 lives and have been profoundly damaging to church unity. Putin's government has also used its vast propaganda machine to undermine synodality by engaging in a smear campaign against the Council of Crete. And we personally witnessed this uh, uh, when we had the privilege of participating uh, uh, in the Council. My point is not that we need a Putin-like figure to ensure the conciliar process, perish the thought. Rather, my point is that the, in the absence of a papal or imperial figure exercising some form of authority over the universal church, we need to search together for a new mechanism to support pan-Orthodox synodality at the global level. So let me share an additional reason why we need such a new mechanism and why the existing mechanisms are not sufficient. Now suppose, just suppose, we develop a perfect theory of universal primacy. Now, so in this century, there have been several theoretical breakthroughs in this arena. And so, for example, the Ravenna document produced by the Joint International Commission of the Theological Dialogue between the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox Church in 2007 was a very important step uh, uh, forward. In this document, if this document were taken seriously, it could trigger a shift in Orthodox thinking about the relationship between synodality and primacy. Previously, synodality and primacy tended to be regarded as mutually exclusive. The Ravenna document, in contrast, encourages to think about synodality and primacy as interconnected and interdependent. Now, on the other hand, the Ravenna document nudges also the Roman Catholic Church towards a more conciliar approach to universal primacy. And uh, the document also makes clear to the Orthodox Christians that a form of universal privacy is vital for Orthodox conciliarity. And so despite its narrow emphasis on Episcopal authority, the Ravenna document is a really important step forward. Now, I should note that the Ravenna document was produced in a somewhat unusual set of circumstances since the delegation of the Russian Orthodox Church walked out of the meeting protesting the ecumenical patriarchate's actions in Estonia at that time. We may have already forgotten about this, but Estonian situation is actually very similar uh, uh, in, in, in terms of the coexistence of two canonical churches to the present situation uh, in Ukraine. In our polity, no primate has the authority to prevent another self-governing church from abandoning a conciliar proceeding in this manner. And so ironically, the absence of a properly functioning institution of universal primacy has prevented the Orthodox Church from uh, jointly deliberating on the issue of primacy in the context of dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church. So Moscow then criticized the authors of the Ravenna document for putting forth a doctrine of dual primacy of Rome and Constantinople. And in 2013, the Moscow Patriarchate's Department of External Relations unilaterally published a position paper in which the universal primacy was reduced to something purely honorific and symbolic. More recently, 
Archdeacon John Chrysavgis edited a substantial two-volume collection of essays, Primacy in the Church, uh, the Office of Primate and the Authority of Councils, published by St. Vladimir's Press in 2016. To date, this has been the most comprehensive study of the issue of, Orthodox, uh, of primacy by the Orthodox scholars. Drawing on this important groundwork, as well as the work of many others, the Orthodox Church may eventually develop a teaching on universal primacy that would be equally acceptable to Constantinople and Moscow, as well as the remaining self-governing Orthodox churches. Note, however, that this perfect teaching, what, what this perfect teaching will actually be doing. It will outline the prerogatives and limit the authority of, theoretically at least, the most powerful Episcopal see in worldwide orthodoxy. Now, the application of this perfect teaching to a complex political reality of church governance is going to be a major challenge. It would be naive to expect anything else. Even if the future sound doctrine of universal primacy is not contested in theory, and it could be, its ap ap applicability will be tested in practice. So this is a bit like a situation with the ruling president testing the limits of the Constitution. It's obvious that the text of the Constitution alone, no matter how perfect and how detailed the part outlining the impeachment process, is not enough to make the president accountable. Rather, a functioning system of government which incorporates the relevant checks and balances is required to ensure accountability. I suggest, therefore, that in addition to a sound teaching on universal primacy, which we certainly need, we also need a new mechanism that will provide safeguards to the conciliar process. So before I get into the details of this mechanism and how it would work, let me state more clearly what this mechanism would be designed to do. Our historical memory and our recent experience will provide some important clues and reality checks along the way. And so what did the Council of Crete teach us? As I observed earlier, the Council of Crete has exposed the vulnerabilities of our polity and the wounds of our conciliarity. Now, what are these wounds? The preparatory work leading up to the Council was left in the hands of a small group of individuals. This clandestine group worked with many interruptions and unforeseen delays. Now, the core of the Council's agenda was already formulated in the 1960s and 1970s, and then it was largely an exercise in subtraction. And so obviously it was bound to become somewhat obsolete by the time the Council actually happened. Unfortunately, the Council set aside the central canonical question that continues to trouble the church, namely the adjudication of jurisdictional disputes and the procedures for granting autocephaly. However, even if these important issues had been considered by the council, the voting procedures adopted prior to the council would have severely handicapped any substantial decision making. The notorious consensus rule states that any major decision had to be made unanimously meaning that each self-governing church voting as one member had to sign off on the decision. This rule effectively endowed any one self-governing church with a veto power. Such a rule represents a departure from the practice of the ecumenical councils in which many matters were decided by public acclamation rather than by formal unanimity. Now, in terms of representation, the Council of Crete demonstrated that in the absence of the papal or imperial figure, at the present historical moment, the Orthodox Church may talk conciliarity, but it finds it very difficult to actually walk the synodal walk together. The meeting of all self-governing churches remains an aspiration rather than a reality. One might ask, could a council still be regarded as pan-Orthodox if one self-governing church does not participate? Uh, what if over a quarter of all self-governing churches do not participate? While for some this would not be a deal breaker, it is clear that the decision-making authority of such a gathering would be weaker than that of a more representative council. For my purposes, the important point is that in, in the absence of an emperor or a pope, we need a new mechanism for safeguarding the conciliar process. Let me repeat that I believe that a sound doctrine of universal primacy is necessary. 
However, again, I don't believe that such a doctrine is sufficient because the exercise of primacy was always, will always require robust checks and balances. The story of the council, as it was covered by the media, tended to focus on how the four absent churches undermined the council. Besides the obvious issue of the no-show delegations, the council had a deeper structural problem with representation. Namely, the council was a predominantly Episcopal affair. Some lesser clergy, monastics, and lay scholars were invited as special consultants who could be present at conciliar sessions but had no speaking or voting rights. In this group, the overall number of lay consultants was lay less than 20 for all 15 delegations, which is about a tenth of all official delegates. In some church delegations, there was a confusion between the special consultants proper and, for example, the interpreters or members of the press corps. Only the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the Church of Albania invited female special consultants, two monastics and two laywomen. Now, if you think that this is an improvement over the ages past, you would be mistaken. The Empress Pulcheria and Irene exercised far greater influence upon the proceedings of the third, fourth, and seventh ecumenical councils than any of today's special consultants whose presence was largely symbolic, unfortunately. At the same time, if anybody has any doubt that the Orthodox female scholars wish and are qualified to participate in the conciliar process, let them read the only English language book on the reception of the Council of Crete. This collect uh, collective volume, which breaks some important new ground, was edited by Kerry Frederick Frost, who is in our midst today, and is entitled The Reception of the Holy and Great Council, Reflections of Orthodox Christian Women. I should add that the contributors include some female scholars that are also present in this room. Could I have a show of hands, perhaps, for just the people who? Um, and so, thank you for your work. Um, my comments about the Council of Crete are not meant to be a lament, but a call to action. As an event, the Council was, has awakened the conciliar mind of our church. The Council has revived a global conciliar process. It's not purely symbolic that the Council started with the Divine Liturgy on the Feast of Pentecost and ended with the Divine Liturgy on the Feast of All Saints. As I stated earlier, the Eucharistic Assembly itself is a Council. When such an Assembly brings together the leaders of self-governing churches, it becomes a tangible sign of pan-Orthodox unity. The local, regional, universal, and eschatological dimensions of conciliarity are all co-present at this liturgy, which becomes a source of all conciliar work. From this liturgy, this acting together in a synoxis, the participants then proceed to walk together, and this is literally how they walked, actually, from uh, the church of the monastery close to the Academy of Crete towards the uh, uh, building where the, con uh, the council took place in a synodos. At the beginning of my talk, I emphasized that local, regional, and eschatological levels of conciliarity include lay people. It is then an exception, or more precisely, an aberration of synodality to make a pan-Orthodox council an exclusive prerogative of the bishops. My proposal then is straightforward. In order to recover the fullness of synodality, all members of the body of Christ including the lay people and lesser clergy, need to participate in the conciliar process. For the next Pan-Orthodox Council, this process will involve the improvement of the conciliar procedures, the discussion of the conciliar agenda, the preparation and organization of the event itself, the coverage of the event in the media, and the subsequent reception of the Council. Now, time will permit uh, to dwell only on two points in the discussion of the conciliar agenda and the preparation of the Council. And so as far as the discussion of the conciliar agenda is concerned, it is short-sighted to leave the matter exclusively in the hands of the bishops and let the remaining members of the body of Christ play passive observers or external commentators. You might recall that this is exactly what happened with the agenda of the Council of Crete, which was forged by the Preparatory Commission in a clandestine manner. The Preparatory Commission announced in the fall of 2014 that the Council might take place soon. 
We had to obtain the agenda of the Council via non-public channels, and some of us remember the intrigue surrounding this. OTSA then, Orthodox Theological Society in America, brought some of the scholars present here for a meeting in New York. Most of us greeted the news of the Council with much hope and enthusiasm. At the same time, we felt frustrated to be cut off from the conciliar process. So would it be possible for scholars and lay leaders to participate in discussing and shaping the agenda of the next council in some way? Now, one vehicle for the discussion of the conciliar agenda could be an international society, which would be in principle open to all members of our church. In 2017, together with many people uh, gathered in this room, uh, we created the International Orthodox Theological Association. We use the acronym IOTA because we didn't wish to be presumptuous. IOTA is the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet. And because IOTA is the first letter of the word Jesus in Greek. We were inspired by three events. First, by the activity of the scholars, many of whom are present here today which was organized by the joint efforts of OTSA and the Fordham Center for Orthodox Christian Studies in spring 2015. The product of this activity was this edited volume, which was made available on Crete and was distributed to the council delegates. I actually, myself, was pleasantly surprised by, uh, by the fact that actually bishops picked up uh, the volume and at least uh, uh, leafed through its pages. This was a work of inspiration and frustration. We were inspired to begin our thinking in a conciliar manner. I distinctly recall the palpable excitement in the room when we presented our position papers on the eight topics to be addressed by the council. We were also frustrated because we realized just how low our expectations were and that we couldn't look at the conciliar process, from, uh, we could only look at it from without, not from within, as external commentators. Now, the second event was the scholars' meeting in January 2016 in Istanbul, organized by Archdeacon John Krisavgis, when we presented our reflections and aspirations to the ecumenical patriarch. The third event was the Council of Crete itself, in which I and Gail Voloschek participated as members of the ecumenical patriarchate's press team. In summer and fall 2016, we began discussing our plans about IOTA with friends and colleagues, and everybody was quite supportive. IOTA was born as a nonprofit in February 2017. The next year, we brought IOTA's leadership, about 30 group chairs, to Jerusalem. As many of you know, in January 2019, this past January, we had our inaugural conference in Yash, Romania with over 300 speakers from 40 countries attending the event, including five bishops from five different churches. Now, we certainly did not expect our inaugural conference to become the largest international gathering of Orthodox scholars in the past thousand years of history. And we owe such a strong participation to the support and leadership of many scholars that are with us tonight. Now, how many people actually joined us in Yash? Could I, could I have a show of hands? Okay. Thank you. So I hope that many of you uh, will join us at the next conference planned for 2023. And we're certainly very grateful to OTSA for providing the stipends for emerging scholars. So given the synergistic relationship between OTSA and IOTA, we might consider having, as I mentioned already at our business meeting, we might consider a joint international meeting every four years. And just as OTSA could facilitate the conciliar process at the regional and national level by working with the assembly uh, uh, of the canonical bishops, IOTA is positioned to advance the conciliar process at the universal level. It is important that both organizations do so by contributing to the work of the preparatory commission, which needs to be considerably expanded. We should not simply react to Episcopal decisions. It is important that these decisions are made in light of the broader work of the church, which could be organized by an international think tank. This would also have a positive effect uh, of nudging the scholarly community, which is often quite discordant to think in a conciliar manner. So I think that the conciliar process really humbles and shapes also the way in which we scholars approach what we do, uh, both in the classroom and also uh, for the sake of the church. 
The reception of the documents of the Council of Crete has been rather tepid and sedate, with the exception of the document on ecumenical relations. If robust lay participation is assured at the inception of the conciliar process, then there will be far greater chances of retaining lay interest in the subsequent reception of the Council. And in our age, reception begins and is shaped by the media. And so in the future, if the conciliar process becomes more reliable, the Council organizers should draw upon the gifts and talents of a larger number of Orthodox journalists, commentators, public intellectuals, clerics, to convey the message of the Council to the rest of the world. In using social media, we should strive to make the message of the Council accessible to those without theological training, and most especially to our youth. Pan-Orthodox Councils are not meant to be secret conventicles of bishops. Greater openness of the conciliar process is vital for the future of our church's mission. So what is then the cure for our enduring jurisdictional divisions? The history of these divisions should make us cautious and sober. Caution re uh, requires that we eschew short-term fixes and begin long-term planning. Such planning would involve a sound theory, which could then be put into practice. I propose that such a theory is conciliar ecclesiology. The foundational insight of this ecclesiology has been formulated by Father Alexander Schmemann. And I quote, before we understand the function of the council in the church, we must see the church herself as a council. Horizontally, conciliar ecclesiology has local, regional, and universal expressions. Conciliarity begins with the community of worshipers gathered around the communion table in Jesus' name. This gathering is the means of our deification. This gathering is the fountainhead of all subsequent levels of church governance, local, regional, and universal. At all levels, conciliarity is not possible without a form of primacy. Historically, at the universal level, primacy has been exercised by imperial or papal figures who convene the ecumenical councils. In the absence of an emperor or a pope, we need to search for new mechanisms. And again, as I said, I propose that the most promising mechanism today is a structure that incorporates lay leadership. To be clear, I'm not arguing that lay participation has to be at the expense of Episcopal leadership. It would be a tragic mistake to pit lay leadership and bishops against each other. Such an opposition would be detrimental to both parts of the body of Christ. Both forms of leadership have distinct charisms within the church. Our church is both hierarchical and conciliar. The charism of primacy at any level of church governance is not an entitlement to autocracy, however. Rather, the distinct charism of any hierarchical office is to safeguard church unity and to nurture conciliarity. And so a sound conciliar ecclesiology calls for a synergy between laity and all ranks of the clergy, including the bishops. At the universal level, we need a new mechanism to prepare the future Pan-Orthodox Council and maximize the chances of its fruitfulness. And so, as I suggested, one such mechanism could be an international think tank that could prepare the work of the Council and involve lay leaders and experts from all self-governing churches. What the faithful around the world embrace, when the faithful around the world embrace the purpose and appreciate the significance of a conciliar event, the church hierarchs who might otherwise be reluctant to attend would think twice before skipping the event. I realize that we are dealing with imperfect human beings, of whom I am first. And as a result, no conciliar mechanism will ever function flawlessly. Nevertheless, a stronger lay participation in the conciliar process will minimize the chances that such a council will be a flop. Ultimately, of course, everything is in the hands of divine providence. Without divine grace, even our best efforts will come to nothing. The everlasting paradigm of conciliar ecclesiology is the communion of the saints. The only hierarchy that exists in the communion of the saints is that of the gifts of the Holy Spirit made manifest in the saints through deification. And some holders of the primatial office will be surprised, for as the gospel reminds us, and I quote, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first, Mark 10, 30, and parallels. And so this quote uh, is quite sobering. 
When all masks are off, when all political games are over, the only primacy that counts is that of Christ. And as an added benefit, there will be no jurisdictional disputes in the kingdom of God, simply because there will be no jurisdictions. And this is perhaps what George Florovsky was hinting at when he said that his baptism was neither in the Russian church nor in the Greek church, but in the Orthodox church. And let us recall then with Florovsky our profession of one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Because it is through this but one baptism that we are united into the life of Christ, that we enter the kingdom of God, and we are joined to the eternal council of the Holy Trinity to whom belongs glory, honor, and worship now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for that penetrating and challenging, uh, but also um, balanced and hopeful presentation of our life together in the church as a conciliar life. Uh, we do have time for questions uh, and some uh, discussion. So um, yes, please uh, go to the microphone so everyone can hear. Yeah, Paul, let me just thank you. It was a fabulous presentation. You know, what I, I worry about, you have a beautiful model for what you think should, should happen for the next Crete or whatever it is. I sometimes think that it's expecting an awful lot for a bunch of churches that are some, not a bunch of jurisdictions that are somewhat dysfunctional to come together and have this wonderful council. I wonder if you know of any examples where it's done right that could be a model for the big council, the next big council that occurs? So, excellent, excellent question. And I think, first of all, we should certainly not idealize the councils of the past, right? Because they were truly tumultuous affairs. But I really believe th that the Holy Spirit has a way of sorting things out in the life of the church. And of course, partially that also happens through reception. So what, for example, did the Council of Nicaea, uh, the first Council of Nicaea in 325 do? First of all, it truly fundamentally sealed our identity. What unites all Orthodox Christians is our confession of the Nicene Creed. And that creed with some additions at the Council of Constantinople is something we recite at every, uh, uh, at every single liturgy. Uh, and so uh, that council for me is a model in two interesting respects. First of all, because it also generated a very significant conciliar activity post-council. And the second reason it's a model for me, because it uh, itself actually for at least two generations uh, was enveloped in considerable amount of controversy. So in that regard, it was not simply a council where people signed really nice documents and, and then proclaim those to the world and the world ignored them or agreed with them. And in fact, if one passes something consequential and important, and of course, primarily, it, it has to be true, true in the sense of corresponding to what God wills from the church. Um, uh, if one has something of significance and value to say, one should expect that the matter should be controversial. I do think we should, uh, I think, look at both the practice of the Anglican Church with its uh, Lambeth conferences and also what they used to, what the Anglican Church used to have, and that is the parallel lay conferences that prepared Lambeth. Uh, lay conferences were only actually happened uh, twice. Again, let me, let me be very clear. I'm really talking about mechanism and process. I'm not suggesting that the outcome was ideal. Uh, the participation of periti, that is to say of the people suitable for particular commissions or scholars and experts, both lay and clergy, uh, at, at the uh, Second Vatican Council is again an important model for us to look into because the scholars were not voting with the bishops, so that this is rather important. Uh, but the scholars and uh, uh, were intimately involved in crafting the conciliar documents of the Second Vatican and also in debating those documents uh, at least 
uh, not on the council floor, uh, but if you will, uh, um, uh, outside. And as all of us know, um, at all conferences, as much fellowship ha happens outside of the actual formal process uh, as on the inside. Am I am I answering am I answering your question? Essentially, those those would be three. Um, three paradigms that I would mention, the, the, the Council of Nicaea, because of how significant uh, it was, uh, and then the uh, more contemporary Anglican uh, and Catholic uh, practice. But I also think, again, that within our conciliarity, within our, uh, the, the, the conciliar thrust and inspiration and nature of our church, I think we have incredible resources also for addressing these questions. In preparing this talk, I was surprised to find that we are are a conciliar church without a conciliar theory. Uh, isn't that surprising? I mean, I, I hope that surprises you, but the claim that we're the Church of the Councils has actually been elaborated. There's a, a, a fairly obscure word, uh, work of Ni Ni Nicholas Afanasyev that deals actually with the first three centuries, and then there's actually some important work of Romanian theologians in German. But apart from that, there's actually very little that has been written uh, that amounts to a significant theory. So a challenge uh, uh, for us is a theory that would be usable in the 21st century. And my my suggestion is that in the absence of an imperial or papal figure, we need to look for new mechanisms. Paul, you honor me with your mention of my book. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? OK. Is that better? Yes. OK. Isn't it nice that both of your board members are asking you the first questions? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you honor me with your mention of the book I edited. Thank you. And my question is somewhat about that. I would like to hear more about what you think would be a robust and ideal lay reception of a council. So, so a robust and uh, an ideal lay reception of the council. I think it's an interesting question. First of all, we should expect that the process, I mean, the process would absolutely, this is not something one could orchestrate. But let me say there are several components to lay reception that are, that are significant in my judgment. So the first component has to do with the, the, the vast majority of the work of the councils is actually forgotten by history. And you might say, oh, how horrible. No, actually, no. Because that's also a commentary, in a sense, of the mind of the church on what's important and what's not. Then there are certain things that are sifted out, like, for example, the Nicene Creed, you know, out of more than, you know, close to 50 councils that met in the fourth century and actually produced various creedal statements. It's the Creed of Nicaea that ultimately became significant. How did this happen? This was certainly not an exclusively clerical and episcopal, making uh, at least if we are to believe some anecdotal details, lay participation was very, very active in debating whether Jesus is divine or not. I mean, this was a big deal. This was, uh, this was not just simply some uh, technical, uh, philosophical or theological matter. This was a matter of fundamental importance uh, of life and death. And so you have this community that is intensely involved in truth-seeking about God. And not only truth-seeking, but in a sense, it finds this truth. And uh, Professor Cohen actually has taught me to think about conciliar process as actually having these moments of clarity and, and definition. So, so then the two ways in which you have lay research and lay participation is A, people forget certain things, and B, people think, boy, this, what, what has just happened, is really immensely significant. Now, between those two, between those two, there is obviously plenty of work for a variety uh, of people. So, for example, it surprised me that the Orthodox Church of America, that was not invited to Creed for canonical reasons, actually produced a prayer for the Council of Crete. This was a remarkable thing, it seems to me, that there was a liturgical uh, uh, realization that something uh, of tremendous value is happening in the life of the church. So I think that's, that's one point that's significant. Uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, the, really the principal point that I wanted to express, and especially, especially for, for, for all interested lay people to understand, is that pan-Orthodox councils are not simply these exotic gatherings for people who really like international travel. 
but rather they are a part of a concilia process that starts at this table, actually. It, it starts at the Eucharistic table. It starts also, or, or rather, it actually continues perpetually uh, in heaven, although, of course, not in a tempestuous way, but in a way of celebrating uh, the Godhead of the Holy Trinity. And so, uh, so I, I, I guess if one understands that, then I think there will be also a greater, uh, uh, greater acceptance, uh, or rather, greater, greater way of participating uh, in conciliar process. I think that some conciliar statements will have to be, will also be challenged, and I think that's also a part of the process. So, in addition of again forgetting and endorsing something enthusiastically, uh, there is also going to be material that will be challenged. And I think uh, a good example of that would be the Council of Ephesus of uh, 431, as a result of which a very significant part of the church, which we call uh, uh, Assyrian Church of the East, or uh, the so-called Nestorians, uh, actually separated from the church. So there's, the, the, the reception, reception is a fairly complex process. I would also say this, that we usually claim that reception will settle all problems. It will not because reception also is a circular process. In other words, we could claim that the church accepted the seven ecumenical councils, but in reality, in fact, uh, significant parts of the church did not accept the Council of Chalcedon. Now, I am not terribly worried about this. I, at least this is a philosopher in me not to terribly worried about this because there are there is a whole host of practices, like perception, for example, that are also circular. And as long as the, the circle is big enough, the, the circularity of it doesn't actually concern me. And this, this is a bit more technical, but I could, you know, I, I could try to explain it easy. In other words, the confirmation of perception usually comes through perception, right? Or at some point, the evidence for the reliability of perception kind of terminates in perception. Something similar, I think, is at stake in the case of the community receiving uh, a kind of a confirmation that the council has spoken the truth and that truth is, is important. I also, and this is rather significant, we, the Episcopal structure of the church is incredibly important. Uh, th th this might strike you as obvious, but it's really incredibly important for safeguarding the apostolic faith and actually for, uh, for, for securing the apostolic succession and the apostolic tradition uh, and the apostolic doctrine and apostolic teaching. And so in that regard, the, sig the role that the bishops play in the conciliar process in no way should be diminished. But I also think that that role would even be more significant and impactful if there is also, as if you will, as a kind of two chambers of government, if there is proper interaction with uh, the lesser clergy and with the lay bodies that would be tasked with, uh, with dealing with specific, uh, with specific issues. I, I hope that that gives you some, some, a, some sense of how I would go about answering that question. Yes. Father Rado. Paul, thank you for your uh, lecture tonight and especially for such a bold endeavor uh, to talk about universal conciliarity in orthodoxy after creed. Um, I wonder if I could push Kerry's uh, question maybe a little bit further in a concrete sense. Um, since we've been talking about uh, reception of the council, could you maybe identify two or three significant things that the council may have said that you think had already an impact in the life of our churches? I mean, for me, and I think this, uh, and I reflect, I think, the position of many people, the importance of the Council of Crete is that it has actually awakened us to think in a conciliar manner in this, uh, about, about the, the small C Catholic a church about about the universal uh, about the universal church. I think the content of its documents, as you know, the most consequential document, as you know better than I, uh, is precisely the document on the relations with the rest uh, of the Christian world. And so, reception in this case, uh, uh, the primary form of reception is interpretation of what is it, of what is at stake. And of course, that I should have emphasized that in answer to uh, Carrie's question, in that the kind of the embracing of a particular position doesn't only mean its faithful, um, its faithful reassertion, but precisely rearticulation, right? For the doctrine, any doctrine to live in the present, uh, it has to be received in the sense of authentic development. 
and it's just that I simply didn't want to get into the do to the accounts and the doctrines of development uh, and understandings of development, and, and that's why I sort of focused on those uh, on those three. Uh, so the most consequential document um, in my mind, and in the minds of many people here present is precisely the document uh, on the relations with other Christians. And I think the principal point that the Council said is that the engagement in and the pursuit of the uh, cause of Christian unity is a worthwhile uh, uh, endeavor that is sanctioned by the gospel and that, that is willed by Christ. And that uh, attempts to simply, from the very, from the very start, to disparage uh, the efforts of the ecumenical movement, that these attempts are misguided. And many of us who participate in the ecumenical discussions might think, what, what's new about this? What was new, of course, is the fact that this was now proposed to the rest of the church. This was now made a statement that was authoritative for the rest of the church. And that's another thing that the councils do. Again, there's so much work to be done on even the the sort of moral aspects of the concilia process because the councils also have this wonderful equalizing effect and when also there is a sense in which the primates of the autocephalous churches discover and realize that there is actually a greater uh, 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 community of accountability and that is precisely uh, a church uh, of multiple self, uh, multiple self-governing bodies kind of gathered 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 together uh, so there's so much to be done even on the notion of the conciliar process.